One of the reasons that Bobby and I broke away from traditional media is because of the bullshit of putting these guys yeah. on pedestals like the Kathy Wood and the you know Michael Saylor, which, by the way, I'm not I'm not trying to disrespect them. I'm disrespecting the stations that put them on there yeah. like they have answered all the questions. It was Abby Joseph Cohen in the run up in uh, tech stocks back in the early part of the century. And, uh, you know, all these still people living off that. Yeah, they're still living off that. And it's it's largely bullshit. If you so, show me someone who's made, you know, 70% for two years in a row, I will probably stay away from that because it yeah. means they're taking risks that I don't like. Today we have Michael Guyad, CFA, self-proclaimed most annoying man on Twitter, which by the way, I challenge that distinction because I work really hard to be annoying myself. And I, I, what I really like about what I think this podcast is going to go is because I think there's going to be a lot of things we agree on, but things we don't. And again, by the way, I know you guys who have been on Twitter a lot, people can disagree on things and not hate each other with the heat of a thousand suns. So I think this is going to be fun. Michael, how are you? Nice to see you. I, I would say you can agree with somebody and not be an asshole. Why you disagree with them? Well, which is it's funny how like you don't seem to hear that too much. But yeah, so I am good. I am uh, I am like everybody else, absolutely hating this environment that we continue to be in, which we'll talk about uh, because I keep going back to like the worst environment for anybody that's active and tactical is an environment where it's only about the S and P, where it's pure <laughs> risk on, where playing defense doesn't matter, playing small caps doesn't matter, playing emerging markets doesn't matter. What matters though is rocket ships. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, just like the insanity of like the memes and, and kind of that era coming back, right? This sure. concentration and not taking investing as a serious endeavor, but more as a game. Well, let's start with that. Because when you look at things like the, the Bitcoin, the absolute meteoric rise of Bitcoin, you look at in my neighborhood, and I live in a, you know, a moderately posh sub Northwest suburban neighborhood of Chicago. There hadn't been a, a house for sale in 10 months. Two houses came on the market last Thursday. Both were sold by uh, Sunday, but the unusual thing is they sold at 30 to 35% more than, than anyone in the neighborhood thought they were worth or thought that our own homes were worth. Now, most people are like going, woo, our homes are worth X, which we thought they were this. I'm a little concerned by it because I think there's a shit ton of liquidity out there and it's ending up at some odd places and people are worried about holding dollars and more want to hold assets. Which, by the way, I'll stop talking at some point in time and let you answer the question. Actually, I'll just pick this time to do that. Go. No, no. And actually, the, um, I, I put out a piece on uh, Investor Place where I said uh, Bitcoin hitting new all-time highs it means the Fed's not going to cut rates. Do tell. Right. Well, because the reality is, what does that mean? It means there's a lot of liquidity, exactly to your point. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, look, look I, I think people don't really understand what happened in November and December, right, where you had basically the stick save from Yellen on the Treasury. And you had Powell through words liquefying the ever living shit out of the stock market, right? Because what, what was the effect of that? They, Powell basically got the market to think six cuts were coming. Oh, and by the way, oopsie, a month and a half later, we got to walk that back because the effect of what happened November, December was collapsing credit spreads. Now, this is something that I keep hammering on, on my lead lag side, the social media and content. Nobody had on their bingo cards that following the fastest rate hike cycle in history, credit spreads would be at cycle lows. Now, why does that matter? Credit spreads tell you about default risk. Right? I always go back to the point that the term risk off, what is the risk that's off in the term risk off? It's default risk. That's what causes the flight to safety into treasuries, which we haven't seen in some time. Now, you've got these really interesting disconnects, right? Where the credit side is telling you liquidity is through the roof. Small caps are telling you there's real credit risk, which is why they're not performing as well because they're being held back by the concerns around higher for longer. You've got a Fed that's basically day trading liquidity through words. And then you've got manic price movement in very speculative assets. And by the way, in very concentrated trades. None of that is healthy. Let's, let's kind of flush that out a little bit. If that's the scenario, then I'm assuming that means to you, which you may have already said it, that the Fed is not going to cut rates. Not only shouldn't they, but they're not going to. Is that what you're saying? I don't see how they could okay. with credit spreads where they are. Look, I, I don't know why anybody is shocked by this reacceleration you know, oh, dynamic of inflation. I know, no, no, but, but look, at the end, I, I said repeatedly last year, I actually thought the Fed over tightened. Mm. Right? I said that's, that was my argument. But then, Same. 
right? Then here comes November, December. And basically they just, they liquefied the system. Now, I don't know if they were worried about, like I was, I was very loud saying, I think our credit event can happen towards the end of the year. Didn't happen. Maybe they were worried about something. They saw something, they flushed the system with liquidity or at least got the market to do it for them, right? But it's like, what do you expect? Do you think the wealth effect from NVIDIA and all this liquidity going to just a select number of tech names driving the S&P, that's not going to have an impact on that house that sold for 30% above ask or whatever, what you thought it would be that you just mentioned, Jim? Like, yeah. of course, there's going to be an inflationary effect from the market itself, right? At least from the market cap weighted averages, which people are invested in, which I think is exactly why Powell started to try to walk it back. They didn't realize how much they liquefied when they probably didn't need to. Yeah, so based on that, like one of my theses has been that um, inflation is not going to uh, get anywhere close to 2%. And I've been saying out there for a couple of weeks now, not, not much more than that, that I think the Fed shouldn't cut rates, but I think they will. I'm a strategist, I'm not an economist, I'm not an analyst. So my thing is what's the market gonna do? Not whether it's right or not, right? I gotta try and find trades. So from that perspective, I've looked at it as not only a reflation narrative, but an accelerating reflation narrative, because I think they may, um, whether you want to call it political or not. I was looking at wages this morning, okay? And wages, there's really three main metrics people look at, right? There's average hourly earnings, there's the employment cost index, and then the Atlanta Fed GDP or Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which I kind of like, and it was it's shown to me by Mike Singleton from Invictus Research, from being mm-hmm. honest, but he pointed out that the Atlanta Fed wage tracker takes out people who make uh, their hourly pay equals $100,000 or more because they tend to get fewer raises. Mm. Okay, So if you take that out, wages are going at about a 5% annualized clip. You put that and you look at crude oil and you look at what some of the industrial metals have been doing as of late. How does anyone justify them cu- cutting at all? I do because I think it's political. Biden would agree with being a strategist because he himself thinks they're going to cut. Maybe, <laughs> or, or maybe is directing. Let's call a spade a spade on that. I think even a step further, to you since you mentioned oil, the Fed is much more likely to hike rates if China suddenly reaccelerates, which, by the way, nobody's really talking about because they've been in this deep deflationary wave for some time and. Granted, it's a very hard dynamic to do, but any kind of moving commodities, which is a form of cost push inflation, is going to be driven by any kind of acceleration in China, right? Which could come out of nowhere. So I'm with you. I don't see how they can cut rates when spreads are this tight. Now, having said that, political or not, there is this legitimate last mile problem that the Fed has, that uh, uh, autonomous vehicles have, that AI will eventually have, okay? Which is the, 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 the last bit of that process is always the hardest. I don't see, and I've made this argument before, I don't see how the Fed can get to 2% with interest rates alone. I think they have to basically, or they need to have the market do it for them. And what I mean by that is you need to have spreads blowing out, a vol spike, a tail event that brings assets lower, that brings with it a disinflation or even period of deflation for a moment in time. Right? Like you need to have something exogenous beyond policy that can shock us back into that rate. And this is the other thing too. It's like, all right, to get to a 2% average annualized inflation rate, you have to go past 2%. Somehow people forgot this. It's not, it's math, right? You have to go yeah. past the average, Yeah, right? which means you need some deflation. You need prices to fall, which will only really happen with some kind of real stress. Okay, so I'm going to mention something. It's eight minutes and 40 seconds into this. We've talked about liquidity. We've danced around this. We have not mentioned the elephant in the room. And that's a hundred, that is a trillion dollars of additional national debt being racked up every hundred days. So that's the first part of my question. Is there, so there a reason we didn't hear that? What? It's just so funny to hear those funny numbers. To hear that. So is there a reason we haven't talked about that yet? And then you talked about the event. Is the event going to be commercial real estate and the holder of those notes? And is that is the house of cards going to collapse when that rears its head? So it's a two-part question. A trillion dollars ain't what it used to be. <laughs> Amen, brother. It's that's the name true. of the show. <laughs> ain't what it used to be. Okay. Um, I don't think it's going to be on the U.S. government side. You go back to like our, our days as cavemen. It's never what you're looking at you have to worry about. It's what's at the periphery. The issue with commercial real estate, the issue with China as sources of you know, global systemic risk is that everyone's talking about it. Yeah. Right? I'm not to say, not, not to say it can't happen, right? Because you can say everyone was talking about the housing imploding, creating a great financial crisis for two years, and then here comes 2008. Well, to put it in Bobby and I's language, by the way, it's not the guy you're squaring off with in the bar. It's the guy standing right, right there. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. Right, exactly on the side. So 
Now, I, I have had this thesis for several months that I think the real risk is Japan. Okay, is what's the, what I what oh. is known as the reverse carry trade. Okay, so and this was a a major source of it's, it's considered to be a major source of what caused some of the dynamics around the GFC from 2007 2008. But you're talking about a central bank which is beyond hilariously behind on trying to deal with inflation with a population that buys more diapers for older people than for babies that has no idea what real inflation is like after three decades. Okay, you just had this wage increase they, they and suddenly they raise rates by 10 bips to go out of negative and big freaking whoop, the yen falls further. Now, what is the issue with Japan? And why do I keep saying that's the periphery? Like that's the thing I think to worry about. Aside from the fact that it's hard for people to understand how much leverage Japan has driven globally for so long, as oil is rising, and the yen keeps depreciating. That means oil in yen is skyrocketing. And they import all of their energy. Cost push inflation. So there's going to be a juncture, I think, where the Bank of Japan will have to stop, step in and try to save the yen. Because otherwise, you will really have a very serious inflation problem in Japan. And they're way behind on this. Which means that there's a scenario where the Bank of Japan could panic and hike rates in ways we've never could possibly imagine. That causes a massive squeeze on the yen. Yen appreciates. It creates a repatriation of that cheap leverage back into Japan, causes that carry trade to reverse, which means all the borrowed yen that's gone into tech stocks. And yes, folks, there is a lot of borrowed money from Japan that has gone into AI stocks, U.S. markets. That suddenly creates a margin call. Right? That creates the vol spike. That has always been my thesis. I always thought that that was sort of the, the thing at the periphery that nobody's talking about and thinking about that is always at the highest risk. And it's hard for people to understand that because... It's like, why would Japan matter? They haven't mattered for three decades. That's why they, they should matter. Okay, so it's similar new, to when everybody's long, you're worried about how long everybody is. Kind of like sort of that situation. I found it fun. This morning, I saw a headline, uh, this is to both of you, Wolf Richter, the founder of Wolf Street. Um, he wrote, Bank of Japan keeps, ma keeps making its loosest ever monetary yeah. policy slightly less loose in tiny steps at the slowest ever snail's pace. That was the headline of his, of his article. So I wanted to ask you then, it, the reverse yen carry trade, is there any possibility, and, and I don't think so, but is there any possibility that's why they're moving so slowly to try and prevent that calamity? Yes, but I, I don't, the assumption that I think a lot of people make is that central banks are omnipotent and can control all things. It's like even that, stupid, right, right. No, 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 it's like even that line of like, you know, don't fight the Fed. It's like, that's nonsense. The Fed cut, has cut rates in every single bear market and markets keep on going down. Like that's just narrative following price. The, the, the central bankers always react to the lag. But I think that's exactly right. And even their own uh, uh, BOJ spokespeople have said, we are worried about in unintended consequences, which is just code for reverse carry trade. Because again, so much leverage has come from it. Look, I've, I've likened this to the butterfly effect, right? Where small changes can have big impacts. It's like 10 bips, okay, 20 bips, even if they go to 100 basis points, so what? No, not when you have so much debt that they've enabled, okay? Not when the yen is this weak. I, the butterfly effect becomes the Mothra from Godzilla. Right? It has all kinds of nasty ramifications on global financial markets. That becomes the spark for the VIX spike, for credit spreads in the US to widen. That's the tail event. And I'd argue that's how you get back to 2% inflation. And I know it sounds like a, like a weird chain of, of, of thinking cause and effect, but I'd argue the, that's probably the best outcome for the Fed. Because how does the Fed avoid being political or looking like it's political? Have a scapegoat. Okay. Scapegoat's Japan. We yeah. have to do something now because of global financial markets, because of Japan's uh, forcing a deleveraging globally. I, you can you can see how they can they can easily use it as the reason to liquefy again. Okay, so but today we're recording on Tuesday. It's the markets have just closed today. The Bank of Japan raised rates, finally going positive. And what happened to the end? It literally got kicked in the nards. By the way. Something you should know about the Futures Edge uh, show is we try to use nards more. I'm trying to bring that back as a word. You can be with me on that or not. But the yen got kicked in the nards. What was that telling us? Is that telling us that it's just not nearly enough? Yeah. By the way, I, I think the last time I, I, I saw that word nards was the CFA level five exam. Uh, <laughs> uh, last time I heard that term. Yeah, right. No, no, but no, no but the... Um, no, I think, I think you're, you're exactly right. And I've made that point. I put that post out yesterday on X. I said, whatever the Bank of Japan does, it's not going to be enough. Of yeah. course, it's not going to be enough. Right. They, don't, they, don't, they don't know how to deal with this. They've never had to deal with this. I think this is a much bigger deal than people realize. That doesn't mean that you have to collapse tomorrow. This is going to be a process for how this, this plays out. All I know is that 
this single-handedly could be the reason that everything changes. Right? It is a big deal how much leverage Japan has enabled. It's a big deal them having to raise rates. It's a bigger deal them having to raise rates with wage inflation, which they haven't seen in so long. And them doing it in these little amounts, it's like talk about central bank credibility. Yeah. BOJ's got nothing. I have a different question, but why the hell does credibility matter? Like, why does anybody give a shit? You know, the credibility uh, sort of graph seems to go like this, depending on how uh, right or wrong they are based on the market's response. It, it's not that I think that you care about credibility. It's when people talk about the Fed want, you know, doesn't want to lose their credibility. It just seems so, like so fucking silly to me. The technical term for credibility should be counterparty risk. Okay, right? fair like enough. Right? Like I think I would it's do more them sitting there going, It's not them sitting there going, we want to do this, but I don't want people to think we don't have any credibility. I mean, it, they do yeah, stupid shit right. all the time. Right. So but, think no, 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 but, but it's like, and it's all right. So if we, if we look at it from the lens of counterparty risk, yeah. then gold's movement is telling you they're losing credibility. Yeah. Maybe Bitcoin's movement is telling you they're losing credibility. I think Bitcoin's challenge because there's a lot of speculative main around the ETFs. So I, I believe that both gold and Bitcoin are not stores of value, are not inflation hedges, where I believe they share commonality and which is valid is they are a hedge to counterparty risk because gold, you can own it and Bitcoin is distributed right, in terms right, of so, pleasure, right? So I got that I'm down with as an argument. So my point is like, you know, if, if credibility is being challenged, then yeah, sure. Bitcoin and-, and It's a no uh, confidence vote. Run. It's a no confidence, right. Right. It's, a, it's a, essentially a vote on no confidence, right. which is why I go back to that headline where I said, the Bitcoin at those highs means the Fed can't, you know, can't cut rates. Okay. So in a recent piece we wrote, I, want to, I just want to shift real quick because this caught my eye when I was reading it. There's more and more people starting to say this, and I want to kind of get your background, background or why you think it. This is from your uh, an article you wrote in Investor Place. If you're an investor in NVIDIA, you probably feel exactly like Cisco investors felt in the lead up to March 2000. Now, we as a firm know people, that's me and Mike Arnold at Path Trading Partners. Uh, Mike personally knows people still waiting to break even on Cisco. Hmm. Okay, so how does that relate to what you're saying in that article? People don't even know. A lot of people are too young to know about Cisco. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are too young to know about anything. <laughs> I, I, I'm... <laughs> I just go back to the Oscar Wilde quote. It's it's like uh, I'm not young enough to know everything. Oh, I like that. I will use great. It's a great line. So, yeah. um, and look, I've been very wrong in a video. I, I, it's like of all the stocks I had to pick on on X, you know, I, like I had to choose the best yeah. performing one, just constantly attacking and insulting it. Not because I'm against Nvidia; it's a great company, but it's like if earnings go up 10x, but the stock price goes up 100x, it's not based on earnings. No, like that's just fact, right? The, the, okay, so let's talk about parallels, differences, and similarities. Okay, yeah. similarity is not necessarily is not in the valuation. Right. Clearly, valuation is not like what it was in the dot-com era for the AI names. So there is there is some real strength there, but it's not fully determined by valuations. It's that feeling of euphoria. It's that feeling of, I need to go all in. Right. So I talk to financial advisors all day long. So I, I have my own research lead lag. I have my own funds, which are rules-based, which will run the exact same way if I die tomorrow. Those funds have had a hard time because they use treasuries as the risk-off option. We should talk about that at some point. But then I, I talk to financial advisors as part of my other my other career role. And there's one advisor I spoke to not too long ago. And he said, listen, I got a prospect. Okay? It's a, a widow who has a $3 million cash portfolio. The husband dies. She's got the, the, the money. She's looking for an FA. FA is talking to her. You know, here's what I do. Here's why I'm great. Here's what I can do to help you, you know, generate income and out, not outlive your assets. At the end of it, she apparently says to him, this is what he's saying to me. Listen, I want to work with you, but I have one request. And I want half my portfolio to be in NVIDIA. <laughs> and the advisor said to her, I can't, I can't have you as a client, right? right. The liability is stupid at that point. Sure. Right? But the, my, my point in saying that is like you're at this point from a euphoria perspective, which I think is very similar to that type of the juncture where it's like it's the can't lose investment. And let's face it, it has, it's, it's been the can't lose, can't lose investment. But it's like when you get to that point where people want to take excess risk because they're extrapolating the past so far out into the future and the speed of the past into tomorrow, that's a real negative sign, especially when it's not being confirmed by all kinds of other parts of the marketplace. I keep going back to this, this problem I have with this AI narrative. If AI is real, three things have to be true. One is utility companies have to be performing really well because AI uses a lot of electricity. That's fact. Okay. Second thing that has to be true, bond yields have to be collapsing because technology is disinflationary. Okay, right. AI is exponential. Yield should be dropping. We've been talking about this on the show for a long time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Third thing that has to be the case, which is the real sticking point in my view, which is why I kept on saying NVIDIA is F word right, for so long and being wrong on that. Small caps should be 
exponential uh, beneficiaries of the marginal improvement that AI as an output would have on their businesses. AI is supposed to level the playing field, right? So all these highly levered small cap companies with razor thin margins, you think the margins would increase because AI makes them more efficient, which means they should actually benefit. They, they consider these like the stakeholders to AI, right? As a, as, a, as a theme, none of that's happening. None of that is happening. Now, maybe it's happening because that last mile of AI, like the autonomous vehicle thesis, like in the inflation at 2% thesis, is so hard to get, but everyone thinks it's going to happen, which means it's going to basically replace all jobs and it's going to be the way of the future. It's also the hardest mile. And that's where all the value really comes in. So nobody's debating NVIDIA as an incredible st uh, company. But the narrative is only being applied to one stock. In the dot-com era, dot-com was being applied largely to everything until the end, which is, that's where I think there's a similarity. It was interesting on the fundamental side of the Cisco story in 2000. Again, I don't know how I don't know what our demographic to the show is. I think it's mostly old, old enough. No, it's definitely old enough to remember the the dot com bubble. But the narrative around Cisco was, you know, the internet is forever and everybody's going to need routers, which turned out to be true, but didn't keep Cisco at its highs for the next 20 years. And I think that's what people get a little confused about when somebody like you or some of the other people who are saying, you know, Nvidia is not going to go up for, forever. They're like well, who's going to who's going to compete with them? I don't fucking know, but somebody is. <laughs> like I don't know. It's always what we don't know that hurts us. What's the Mark Twain quote, Jimmy, that, that we use all oh, the time? Oh, it's what you know. It's what you know for certain that just yeah. ain't snow, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. It is not going to be the Nvidia show for twenty years, which doesn't mean you sell it. That's not Correct. what that means. That's right, and it doesn't mean you short it either. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to wait it and think about it properly. Right. And, and and this is what, the, what I did, I got out of two thirds of my position. I'm going to let the other ride. Um, tell them why you bought it though, Jimmy. I, you, I bought it. it. It was kind of a lark. It was when Nancy Pelosi came out to buy it. So I bought it, but it was yeah. literally like it was trade size. So it was bigger. And I planned on it being kind of a short term <laughs> thing. It's turned out to be my second best trade of the last six months, which I'm embarrassed by. My two <laughs> trades, my two best trades of the last six months have been Bitcoin. That started 18 months ago when BlackRock decided to get into it. That was the entirety of my thesis. And then because of Nancy Pelosi. So now, but now I'm out of two thirds. I'm into one third and that's what I'm going to do. Trim and trail. But Bobby, what are you I, saying? I'm just real quick anecdote. I, one of my best trades of 2022 was Dogecoin and I bought it as a joke because somebody who had a Doge head on there said something positive on Twitter, which was uh, unbelievable that it happened at all. Yep. And I said, oh, I love Doge. And then I went, are you long it? And I went, that's ah, shit. Yes, I'm long it. And I bought a bunch. <laughs> And I ended up making something like 350% before I sold it out. And I got all of a sudden got inundated with all these people with dog heads. And anyway, I don't have a question. Go ahead. That's level well, 10 in the CFA. Yes. Uh, no, Jensen Wang was on um, yeah. uh, that station today that, that I mostly detest. But, he, but um, whoever was interviewing him said, well, why should your company be valued at 2.2 billion market, 2.2 trillion market cap, whatever? And I thought his answer was awful. I thought the answer should have been, that's a, we're a publicly traded company. I know that we have an excellent company with excellent prospects for the future. I know I have a tremendous amount of my wealth tied up into it at this level, and I'm not, and I'm comfortable with that. That's not what he said. He like right. started to give some, which I thought was bullshit. I think that he, these CEOs should have consultants. Okay. Anyway, you talked about um, the small caps and the small cap perspective for 2024. I'd like to hammer it down a little bit too, because I just wrote a piece on it today. And I thought the notion of onshoring, I'm hearing some people talking about that, about global problems, and that you know could disproportionately benefit small caps as well too. Is that involved in that? Or is this just, are small caps starting to finally do well? And the Russell has broken above that 2000 level, which I thought was a big deal. And I still think this might be a good trade for 2024. I'm only kind of this much into it so far. Could it be a good trade for 2024? And if so, why? Yeah, and, and, and before I hit on that, uh, uh... The other big difference between NVIDIA and Cisco is, uh, you know, 20 years ago, nobody ever talked about gamma squeezes. Right, exactly. Now we all, like, uh, we all know that. Yes. We, it's like, yeah. there, there, is, there is this, uh, let's call it what it is. It, it is manipulation. Yeah. It is manipulation. And it's, to be, it's being done in front of our eyes. And it seems to be perfectly legal, right? But it creates real distortions in price as a signal of anything. Price is no longer truth. Price is a gamble. Like that's that's what's happened with with the that. option side, the tail wagging the dog. Okay, now let's talk about small caps. Okay, small. It's it, it is true 
that in pre-election years, last year, large caps historically outperformed small caps. So you can argue that's according to script, not to the extent that we saw. It's like, I got to tell you, I really am blown away. People seemingly forgot or didn't realize that in October of 2023, last year, the Russell 2000 and micro caps, their ETFs, you can validate this, broke the October 2022 levels. They were actually getting into 2020 crash type of territory. Like we were actually very much on the edge of something happening. I was very wrong saying I thought a credit event would happen towards the end of the year. It didn't happen. But something was off towards the end of October. You could see it in some of these names performing that way. So it's true in pre-election years, small caps underperform. In election years, small caps tend to outperform large caps. Okay, so you could say from a presidential cycle perspective, small caps have a good chance of outperforming. Now, outperforming does not mean make money. It can be down less. And the real example of that is 2000. If you look at the relationship of the Russell 2000 against S&P, that ratio, which looks like it's bottoming, it's very volatile, right? but looks like it's bottoming, that ratio is back to 2000 levels. The ratio then turned higher, means meaning small caps were up more, down less, but because it was a bear market, it was down less. I, I like small caps as a contrarian trade. I say contrarian only because what are you really betting on, on small caps? You're betting on zombie companies surviving. Right. You're betting on the idea that as they roll over their debt into this higher for longer dynamic, the distress is not real or is being overly priced in, in which case those will get repriced higher. But this, that still remains to be seen. To me, that's still a question mark, right? Because okay, again, well, I go back to this difference between small caps lagging because of debt and then credit spreads saying something else totally well, different. This, so something kind of makes sense to me. And I think so what, we're, what we're talking about, and we're talking about is Jay Powell political. And are we talking about the fact that in election years, in big election years, there is a tendency for interest rates to be held slightly inorganically low compared to where they should be, which I don't even know if where they should be is even a good way to say it. But is that what we're talking about? Why small caps maybe perform because the rates are a little bit lower? That's really interesting. It's an interesting theory. Um, maybe um, because especially, yeah. you know, as you know, right, this kind of debt tsunami is starting, right? It's like right. And people only are going to talk about that when stocks go down, just like people only talk about the yield curve when stocks go down. Right. Right. It's like the narrative is going to fall. The narrative is always going to fall apart. But yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that, I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. I think that that makes maybe some sense. I guess it depends on the duration and the term, right? Sure. Okay. So they lower short rates, but what about how does the two year, three year, four year, the intermediate side, which is where they roll over the debt? So there might be some nuances, but yeah, I think there's some truth. The reality is, though, like we're still in this distorted environment because you're not seeing that yet. Right? Yeah. It's still a large cap tech only world, growth only world. It's still a risk on only world. And we're at a point now, I'd argue, which is like, you can't beat the S&P 500 unless you give up being a fiduciary. Like if you're managing money for other people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right? It's no longer, I'm sorry, but the S&P is no longer a diversified index. I know right. everyone references the market and say they say it's the S&P. That is not the market anymore. When you have this kind of concentration of stocks and outsized attribution from a select number of, again, large tech companies. Small caps make sense. I think international also makes sense. You need to have the dollar weaken in some sustained way. The only caveat to me saying that is I could have said that at any point in the last 10 years. Mm. It was so interesting what, uh, this morning. The SP was lower, although most of the sectors in the SP were higher, but tech was lower. So it was literally like dragging down the index in the negative territory. Well, when you looked at it on a sector level, it was the majority of them were green, right? And whenever I see that, I always tend to think that it's going to. I didn't actually even see where we ended up on the close here. Did we end up positive? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Ended up it's high. Right. So you yeah, mentioned it's like the funniest thing. It's like, you know, SP closes at highs and small caps, it's like that Rambo giphy. It's like, what about me? Right? <laughs> it's like hey. small caps are like, haven't they done anything since 2021? I mean they, they, it's a, and and by the way, I, I keep going back to it's like some people will say I hear, I keep hearing this no, uh, argument. Who cares about small caps? Everybody's indexed to large caps. Who cares about small caps? Are you kidding me? If some of these small cap companies go broke more of the unemployment rate would rise from small caps and from large caps right. because there's more companies. Right. Right. You're still talking about the job creating engine. When you're yeah, talking of course. About small it's small business. Companies. It's the equivalent of small business in the public markets. So how can we say small caps don't matter? So where do you fall? Well, actually, let me hold that question till later. You mentioned treasuries as a risk off asset. And you said we should talk about that. Yeah. Um, are you talking about RORO, the ETF, or what are you referring to? Let's take a step back. So I've got yeah. three funds. Yep. Mutual fund, two ETFs. I designed my own funds to be rules-based, to give me time to do a lot of other things, right? Mm -hmm. And to use treasuries, long duration, as the risk-off option. The signals that I'm known for, lumber gold, utilities, treasuries themselves, tell you about volatility likely increasing. 
they'll tell you about trends. So the, anything that I've documented as leading indicators about volatility dynamics changing. And usually when volatility is rising, you want treasuries because treasuries tend to be the beneficiary of a VIX spike, of a vol spike in equities. Now, this is a big misconception, I think, that people have. People say treasuries have failed over the last three years. And they say that because look what happened in 2022. Any kind of decline, treasuries have not gotten off the mat. It's been my hell because my signals have largely been right saying risk off volatility, but treasuries are not as the expression working. And I have to be in treasuries. So why people think I'm like a knucklehead on X. And it's like, folks, if I die tomorrow, it runs the exact same way. It's just, this is a nasty cycle for that as a risk off expression versus the dollar, which did well versus gold versus utilities on relative basis, other risk off imperfect hedges. Okay. Treasuries are not a hedge to stocks though. And this is what everybody gets wrong. Treasuries are a hedge to credit spreads, credit spreads widening, which goes back to my point. What is the risk that's off and risk off? It's default risk. So what happens is when you have the VIX spike and you have volatility increase, credit spreads will widen. There's a coincident behavior. Why? Because the bond market starts saying volatility in stocks means doubt. If there's doubt about the future, that means I, as the lender of capital to this highly levered triple C debt issuer, should doubt getting my money back. So I need more yield to compensate for the risk that I may not get back my loan. So you step up. Causes, right? That's right. Exactly. That's what causes the spreads to widen. Now, at the margin, as those spreads widen, some investors say, I don't like this. I don't want to be in this triple C issuer. Let me go higher quality. Let me go to triple B, flight to quality. Let me go to triple A. Ultimately, the treasuries, because the U.S. government has a printer, you will get your par back. Might be less after inflation. No. It might be, will be, right? But you're going to get your money back. That's what causes that sequence, that flight to safety convexity, when treasuries really work, which we haven't seen really since the 2020 COVID crash. That's been the missing ingredient throughout this. It goes back to my point that nobody had it on the bingo cards. You'd have the fastest rate hike cycle in history and spreads would be at cycle lows. Now, if you were to have the long awaited credit event, spreads should widen. You should see money go back into treasuries for trade, not for a buy and hold. And that brings with it other asset prices going down. That's the world my funds live in, right? That's the risk off. Now, my funds have had a hard time. Roro did actually fairly well without the risk off last year. It was up like 30 some odd percent. This year it's okay, right? Nothing's standing out. This year, it, anybody in the ETF or mutual fund world knows that this environment is horrendous because everyone's being compared against the S&P, independent yeah. of what your strategy and prospectus says. It's the worst environment for asset gathering, but it's always about cycles. And I, I think because everyone is so negative on treasuries, that hedging behavior probably will kick back in fairly soon. So is this an oversimplification, and does it have validity? We use, credit spreads are unbelievably narrow. Um, things have gone through the roof, like real estate, whatever. M2 money supply has gone up since last May, not down, yep. and national debt is exploding. Is this all related? Is liquidity because of the government spending like drunken sailors, and is liquidity ending up in odd places like distressed debt, bad debt, whatever you want to call it, and all those other bullshit things as well. Is that what's happening here? Yeah, I think I think the simplest answer is the right one. That's exactly what's happening. Right. And 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 just as that has cycles, so will that. Meaning right. you'll have that come out, right? And that's why I go back to the liquidity drain could come from Japan. It's it, all this is ultimately related. Okay. Right. And, and it's all it's all kind of one big threat, right? That you can kind of pull at to kind of really play with. And it goes back to why small caps haven't participated in a real bull market. You want the most illiquid, distressed shit that's out there. We can agree okay. on that, right? You guys have been in business yeah, for sure. No, I like right? that. Yeah. You, want, look, you should not be wanting NVIDIA. Oh, I love what you're saying here. Bobby? Yeah. So I, whenever we have somebody scheduled for the show, and you've been scheduled for a while, um, we've, I'm glad we got to this date because it's been fun so far. Love it so far. Um, yeah. Yeah. I watch their, their ex pretty closely. And I, I don't you're laughing know. Throughout I, I'm laughing my ass off. Because it is a persona. I, I'm blown away. Literally I'm like the, a joke. The Roro, the R-O-R-O -O question comes from you challenging people to short it. And I thought that was. Oh, yeah. I put that out today. Yeah. Yeah, I was rolling. I was absolutely rolling. Yeah. I'm like, this guy is brilliant and insane. All um, at the same time. <laughs> all at one. I'll take I, don't know, I don't know where you stand on Bitcoin. And I think it's fair for me to say part of my stance first because all of my questions end up being many speeches. From a perspective of Bitcoin, one of the things that bothers me about it is uh, Jim Bianco put up a chart the other day that illustrated it perfectly. Triple leverage QQQ and a Bitcoin chart line up like they're identical twins. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. And it's I've said for a long time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> I've said these are so valuable. Edward, yeah, it must be. Yeah, I, I, I've said for a long time the type of people that want to be only in Nasdaq or fifty percent in Nvidia, the type of people who go, yeah, I'll, I'll try this Bitcoin. I'll put half my money in it. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the kind of the kind of thing that Bernie Madoff would have loved to see if he was just getting into the investment game now. Now I am a believer. You know what? I'm not going to say that stupid believer in the technology shit. Where do you uh, come in on Bitcoin? Not what it's doing from a price action perspective, yeah. but as an investment vehicle. Okay. So separate from my own funds, because it's unrelated to the strategy, right? Yeah, of course. The, the, the purest definition of the market is what? All investable assets. Sure. Yeah. It's not the S&P 500. It's not even just equities. The market in the classic traditional finance sense is all investable assets, which would mean Bitcoin included. Bitcoin uh, clearly has been an incredible winner. It's funny how people don't seem to understand past performance does not indicate future, it's not indicative of future results, including when it comes to Bitcoin. Because you, people always come back and say they'll show some chart of it being the best performing asset over the last 10 years. And I always want to go back to these people that automatically post that when I criticize their narratives and say, well, I hope you bought into it back then. Because if you did, you should be on an island enjoying your life, not on X. Yeah. Hating life like me on that social media platform. I enjoy hating life on X though. So there's a little bit of crossover, but anyway. I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> Believe me, if I could, I'd be totally off social media, but it's a, it's a, it's a necessary evil, unfortunately, yes. from a business perspective. Yeah. Okay, so, so I think it makes sense as a, as a portion of a portfolio. There, there is a lot of, plenty of evidence that shows that rebalancing across any asset class boosts alpha, boosts our performance. And rebalancing works best with volatile assets, right? Which means if you did what's called a dumb rebalance, let's say you just rebalanced from a 2% Bitcoin allocation against everything else in your portfolio, and you did that rebalance every month, you'll get a much better outperformance, right? Well, I gotta stop you. Price. They won't, the Bitcoin people, the people holding Bitcoin tend to be anti-government, tend to be no confidence vote. They don't want to pay taxes ever, right? <laughs> so they don't rebalance Bitcoin. So nobody sells out of the position. That belongs in this discussion, right? Yes, but, but they will with ETFs. Oh, so, good this is, so this is the other thing which I think everybody is also wrong on. Okay? And I know this because I have a mutual fund and I have two ETFs and I know the studies on this. For all of the talk about ETFs being the superior wrapper, the holding period for ETFs sucks. Okay? Meaning most ETFs are not held for long-term capital gains, which is the real benefit of the ETF structure. Because there's this constant temptation to trade an ETF because it prices second by second as opposed to a mutual fund, which is priced once a day, which is why assets tend to be stickier for a mutual fund than for an ETF, even though they're both funds. Right. So my contention is, and I, said, I put this post out before, it's like, just wait and see what happens when Bitcoin starts going through a real downturn, what the ETF side of it does, because they are not going to be holders. They're not. They're going to sell because that's what the ETF structure tempts them to do, right? So that's why I keep going back to, I think it's actually going to be a curse for those that are real legit diehard Bitcoin maxi fans. Just be careful what you wish for, because it creates a whole nother type of investor, which is not really an investor. So, so this now, let's bring it a little bit. We got about 10 more minutes. Now you look at 2024 and you look at 2025. You just said the word investor and we, Bobby and I are investors, but we're also traders. Like, what do you like? Because to me, you know, this commodity thing that's happened, I think is very, very fascinating. The copper breakup yeah. is fascinating. Crude oil is fascinating to me. I am more leaning toward that. What do you think? I'm actually bullish on China, but I, I'd be bullish on China through commodities. Bold move. It's, it, it's so distinct from the inflation deflation side of things. And again, I talk to a lot of advisors. It's so under owned because there's statement risk. If you're a financial advisor and you, if you have any kind of fund that has the word China in it, your clients will fire you. So <laughs> like this is like, it's, it's literally called statement risk. It's the risk that there's a fund on the statement That's that has amazing. the word China. Right? Yeah. So my point is that there is, there is an underinvestment. Now, look, a lot of people argue, and I don't disagree. Why in the world would you invest in China? You know, they, they literally confiscate assets. They literally destroy industries. Sounds like inflation in the U.S. I mean, it's, okay. just another, way, it's another way of, of confiscation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And there's a price for everything. That's what I was going to say. There's a price. That's the answer to the question, right? Right. So yeah. it's like the, the role of any trader and investor is it's only, there's only one question. Like you think our entire industry. There's only one question each and every one of us need to answer. Is current price an overreaction or an underreaction? That's it. Every single question goes back to that question when it comes to any trade, any investment. Is current price overreacting or underreacting? So 
The question well, becomes how long that's been going on as correct, well. Right. There's a time for the reaction. That's exactly yeah. okay. Good. Yeah. Right. So, so, so my point is that okay. Well, is there an overreaction in China prices here, given how negative and bearish and underinvested? Yeah, probably. Probably. Is there an overreaction on the AI narrative? Yeah, probably. Right. Now that doesn't mean that you you know you you buy it tomorrow in the case of China and you sell U.S. AI, but it's like you're closer. And this is the other thing too. It's like all right. Everybody talks about momentum and trend following. Okay. The joke about momentum is that you need to have momentum for there to be momentum, which means you're mathematically missing the biggest part of the compounding performance sequence, which is the turn. Right? The biggest returns don't come from the middle of the trend. The biggest returns come from the turn of the trend. People always say, don't catch the falling knife. If you happen to catch the falling knife, that makes a huge difference in performance. That's yeah. just compounding, right? So my point is like, you have to, at some point, every investor has to ask the question, are we at a point now where it's worth the risk to bet on that mean reversion that kickstarts the momentum? And to your point about time, the longer the time is there that that has not been the case, the more likely you are to the turn. Right. You know, the, the evil of the rules-based approach, and I'd say e evil tongue-in-cheek, obviously, is that you spend a lot of your time defending as to why you don't change it. Yeah. When it's working against you in that particular period of time, and you could pull it's up, my it's been like my 35 years of data. Here's why I'm not moving. No, no, it's like if people actually listen to people like you, there would be no Bernie Madoffs because they would know that's not possible. Like yeah, that, and, that and, kind of and there's always look. I'm I'm the first. First, of all, I'm very open about like what's happened, and I explain why. Like it's it's very clear. We've never had a mm -hmm. juncture where long duration treasures are down more than equities in a top 20 drawdown for equities. You look at any other major drawdown for equities, treasuries were the risk off hedge. They were either down less or up. And that, by the way, includes Pui Volcker. So the argument that's because of the 40 year bond bull market, total nonsense, right? So you're right. People say, well, just change your prospectus. Are you kidding me? Change, <laughs> ch change, chase the cycle. Are you kidding me? I guarantee what will happen if you do. You're right, it'll start to work. It'll work. Like, it'll start to work, of course. So yeah, it's like return chasing. It's the kind of thing people yeah. don't do in their everyday life, but in their investing, they want to do it all the time. You know, and it's you and know? it sounds it sounds smart though. When things don't work, I change my strategy. Okay, that's like so. You then what? You're never down. You never have drawdowns. <laughs> this, is, this is silly. This I is never. I've right. uh, never had a losing trade. I don't no, even know. You're you're, you're you're just because you're incredible. What can I tell you? But it's like you know. <laughs> Uh, clearly, I'm not right, but but yeah. like everybody, I, I use that line all the time. It's like there's no gurus, only cycles. There's no gurus, only cycles. I can point to any number. I can point to any number of star traders, right, or star managers, you know, by the, the men and women, okay, who were on the Bloomberg uh, uh, cover, and it's like it's not because of them. It's because that's the mandate they put in their prospectus, and it happens to hit in the right time. I Can't went through it. this. Right, I went through this in 2020. <laughs> Yeah. In 2020, my mutual fund was up 72%, right? I, I was risk off in treasuries based on the signals. Mid-January, COVID crash happens, TLT rockets. And then the signal goes back risk on March 31st, pretty much a week after the low. So that's like a 30%, 35% move like that, right? And then the rest of the year, some rotations end up being up 72%. And people would talk to me like, oh, you're like a gunslinger. You're incredible. How'd you do? And I'd, I'd be the first one to tell them. It's it's not based on discretion. It's 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 a process that's systematic, and the cycle for risk on risk off worked. That fund then went round, round trip because we got back into a pure risk on large cap only world, which is the bane of my existence because you can't beat the S and P when it's the only game in town because you get whipsawed playing defense. Market keeps going higher, it keeps slowing down entering the storm. You never have the accident. You keep trying to play small caps, you get whipsawed. You keep trying to play emerging markets, you get whipsawed. So, like, but that's a cycle also. Right. And it's so missed by people that so much of what people uh, think makes them a great trader, their signals, is probably more because they just happen to be trading the right opportunity set in the right cycle where you have that tailwind that means the whipsaws are less. It's interesting. When I was at a fund of fund for eight years and I was on the investment yeah, committee. You know this very well. Years. Sure. Yeah, I was on the investment committee for six years. And the first thing we look for, for people watching right now, what, what Michael's describing is called style drift. And the minute that you, where we would get stacks of uh, return profiles every month, and every single month we went directly to the ones who had consecutive months of losses, and then we looked for style drift. And if there was style drift, literally crumbled up and chucked because you can't build a fund unless you know 
uh, fund of funds at least, unless you know the profile of the performance of those funds for the different periods of time. I want to add something too, by the way, too, is that one of the reasons that Bobby and I broke away from traditional media is because of the bullshit of putting these guys yeah. on pedestals like the Kathy Wood and the you know Michael Saylor, which by the way, I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect them. I'm disrespecting the stations that put them on there yeah. like they have answered all the questions. It was Abby Joseph Cohen in the run-up in uh, tech stocks back in the early part of the century. And, uh, you know, all these still people living off that. Yeah, they're still living off that. And it's it's largely bullshit. If you so, show me someone who's made, you know, 70% for two years in a row, I will probably stay away from that because it yeah. means they're taking risks that I don't like. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and the other thing, too, is just as part of the, the industry. Okay, so, again, I'm in the mark to market mutual fund ETF world. I launched them. Wrong time. I launched my ETFs in the worst bear market for treasuries in history, just as it was about to start. It's like my timing on cycles clearly sucks, right? Yeah. Still believe in the approach, obviously, which is why they're not closing. I'm, I'm, I'm fully committed. But, okay, so if I'm going to compete against all these other mutual funds and ETFs, I have to do something different. I'm not going to compete against a Vanguard, mm -hmm. right? Certainly not on fees. I'm not going to survive, right? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a solo you know, guy. I have a partner in, in Title Financial Group, obviously the firm, the RA that I'm under, but it's like, what am I supposed to do? I have to do something different to stand out. I have to have something that has what Eric Belchunas term is a shiny object moment where it really works and it stands out and then people do what they always do. They chase. Okay. So the only way to do that means it means you have to create a strategy which can have outsized returns, which means it can have outside risks too. It can be very diverged from everything else if the cycle is not in its favor. Most strategies are variations of beta. Most things are basically the SV. I do, I do these writings on Seeking Alpha. I am blown away how many ETFs, which should have nothing to do with large cap tech, have in the top 10 names, large cap tech. Yeah. I don't know if people really understand how concentrated the entire industry has become. And you know why? Because that's the only thing that's worked. Right? And they, Wall Street does what it does. It creates products around that which is working because that's what gets assets. People are naive and don't understand that if they have three ETFs and the top 10 names are the same top 10 names, it's the same as having one ETF over allocated. Yes. yes. <laughs> right? So, but what am I supposed to do? Is It's just like, I, it's like everything else it goes back to the persona. I have to wait for the cycle to come to me. How do I do that while keeping an audience engaged? I do all this, these, these antics on X. Right, which is the and it's I don't know how else to do it as I'm waiting, and we are all we we are all beholden to the small sample, which is what we live in. That is amazing and such a brilliant way to describe it too. Uh, there's one last question I'd like to ask before we go. You mentioned China. We did talk about commodities. You've seen the breakout in in uh, copper is and you know they go with the electrification with all these states who are trying to EV us to death. And even though even though EVs are gone, I mean not gone. There's been a they huge should be, in the Huge punch in the nerds to EV. The, even though China has been on the precipice, co copper coiled, copper coiled, copper appears to be breaking out without the benefit of those things. Right. Is that the trade for the next two years? Could be. I only say that because I tend to be more of a deflationist. Okay, and that wouldn't work in a deflationary period. Yeah, I right. mean, it could be. I mean, that deflationist argument, that's yeah, my mindset, could be a 10-year dynamic, and maybe the next two years, our path matters more than prediction, as I always say. But it could be. I... I, I Commodities, as you know, are tricky because of, of the old the kinds of leads and lags right around uh, the mining cycle right, that you tend to have. Again, I think if you're going to bet on China, you bet on copper, you bet on industrial commodities. Any kind of a credit event means the same thing happens, which is reliquification. So it becomes sort of like a disinflation, deflation scare, again, off because of Japan. Then they step in when it becomes so extreme. If then commodities start to run again, and then the cycle just keeps on repeating, making everybody lose their damn minds on X. Right. Bobby, you got anything left or you want to play them out? I feel fantastic. No, I'm Me good. too. This has been outstanding, by the way. Yeah. And I've never spoken to Michael uh, in person. We've communicated on X before, but man, what a great guest. Uh, to you guys out there watching, we want to thank you again. And remember why we do this. Both Bobby and I were long-term veterans of you know traditional financial media, and we found a lot of the process bullshit. Some of the things we talked about before, putting up these cowboys as if they've reinvented the wheel and reinvented the mousetrap, and it's just not the case. We want a balanced discussion, but none of this works without support you guys have given us. So a, a monster thank yous to you guys for subscribing to us, for retweeting us, 
for talking about us to your friends. We get the best feedback in the world. Thank you guys a ton. This has been the, what's the name of this podcast, Bobby? The Future's Ed Show. Thank Michael, you for- where can everybody find you if they want to, by the oh, way? Oh, and where can you find me, Michael? Yeah, yeah. at, at Lee Lagerport, X, YouTube, Lead Lag Live, my own podcast, which I want to have you guys on also. Amen. Uh, Love you know, so we'll do that. And uh, and then YouTube and uh, listen, I'm, I'm available, man. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that just constantly runs forward stubbornly and doesn't give up. 